Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, welcome to our Youth Lead webinar. I'm Maria Brindlmeyer, the Youth Lead Coordinator with the Youth Power Learning Project at Making Sense International. Welcome to today's webinar on Beyond Alarm Bell Ringing, How Young People Can Lead Climate Action, which is sponsored by our partner, the International Youth Foundation. Before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping instructions. You can help share the information more widely on Twitter and Facebook uh, with uh, the handle and hashtag uh, listed above here. And the slides and the recording will also be shared on YouthLead after the webinar, so please also share it with friends that may have missed the webinar. And on today's webinar and uh, also some of our future webinars, you'll get to know some of our team members. Uh, so here in the picture uh, are um, myself and then Abulaji Omitugon and Atlas Corfello, who is working with us. Uh, he's from Nigeria and focuses on knowledge management and communications for both youthlead.org and youthpower.org and Ikena and Yadike also an Atlas Corfello from Nigeria, uh, who also helps with our knowledge management and communications efforts. And here in the room, we also have our communications manager, uh, Rachel, who is uh, helping us with uh, our announcements and uh, other communications efforts uh, for the project. So just quickly background on youth power learning. Um, so Youth Lead is actually a component of Youth Power Learning, uh, which is a USAID-funded project that focuses on knowledge sharing and uh, best practices uh, and learning about positive youth development. And we've defined positive youth development as containing four components, that youth should have assets, the ability to leverage those assets, that agency and the ability to contribute to positive change for themselves and their community. And last but not least, youth should be surrounded by an enabling environment. And so um, we have uh, maintained youthpower.org and some other activities for several years with a focus on youth supporting organization and implementers. And then uh, last year in December, we launched this new platform that is focused on young change makers and uh, from 15 to 35 year old and uh, that focuses on providing youth with different resources and the ability to connect with each other. So the vision is for youth lead to become the global hub for young change makers and enabling them to maximize their impact through networking, mentoring, and accessing information. And the platform offers a great opportunity for youth from different countries and different networks to inspire and learn from each other, connect beyond your traditional circles, and benefit from diverse resources and information. And with Google Translate on every page, it is available to a larger group of youth that may be uh, less uh, familiar with uh, uh, the English language. In April, we selected over 20 young chain makers as youth ambassadors, and uh, recently uh, just concluded the call for our next batch of ambassadors. And we'll be announcing the next call this November. The ambassadors are sharing information about youth lead, with their networks and increasing engagement with youth leads through discussion groups, social media, and also by sharing their experiences through webinars. You can hear some of these past ambassadors' webinars on youthlead.org, and we'll also be streaming more over the next uh, month. As part of our activities, we are leading campaigns on, social, on several social issues with this uh, month campaign being on climate change. We organized the Youth Lead Photo Contest, which gave youth an opportunity to showcase their chain-making work globally. You can find out more about the photo contest on the Youth Lead platform. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we'll be announcing our second cohort of ambassadors in the coming weeks. And uh, finally, we are also organizing webinars, some of which are led by our ambassadors and some led by our sponsors. Our sponsors uh, are promoting Youth Lead on their 
<clears throat> and their youth networks contributing useful resources and offering their expertise and knowledge in organizing skill building and training webinars to our members. Today's webinar, Beyond Alarm Bell Ringing, How Youth Can Lead Climate Change Action, is sponsored by the International Youth Foundation. Allow me to introduce our facilitators for today, uh, today's webinar, who will lead today's uh, webinar on Beyond Alarm Bell Ringing, How Youth Can Lead Climate Change Action. Our facilitator for today's webinar is Matthew Hobson, Writer and Communication Strategist at the International Youth Foundation. Prior to joining IRF in 2017, he was a professor of writing at Loyola University, Maryland, where he taught courses in rhetoric, um, poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction. Matthew earned a BA in philosophy from Pacific University and MFA in creative writing from McNeese State University and a PhD in English from Florida State University. His fiction and non-fictions have won numerous awards and appeared in national and international uh, liter liter literary journals. Most recently, uh, the Baltimore Review at Iowa. He contributes his communications expertise and her working and what Smith skills as part of his marketing and communication team. Ethan, our co-founder, is our second um, facilitator and the co-founder at um, Greenbox a youth-led national think tank aiming to help create routine attitudes, values, and actions for sustainable development. Athen has a master's degree in sustainable, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and innovation management from the University of Nottingham, UK. He has, he has a wide range of professional experience in the development sector with organizations including UNESCO, Punjab Public Health Agency, and International Youth Foundation. Asan currently serves as the, as the head of experimentation for the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, Pakistan. And now I will hand over to Matthew, who will guide us through the, to this webinar and introduce the other speakers. Matthew? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Let me uh, say again, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, as you may know, we have an amazing group of speakers joining us today. I'm going to give them each a quick introduction, and then we'll go through a couple of ground rules, and then we'll get started. First, we have Mohsen Dole, who, along with his twin brother, Asan, co-founded Greenbox. Mohsen has over seven years of diverse professional experience in the international development sector. Currently, as a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford, his latest research focuses on how youth engagement is constructed and interpreted within wider environmental governance frameworks and geographical contexts. Next, we have Mandy Vandenende, who is a coordinating lead author for the UN's Environment Global Outlook 6 for Youth, also called GEO6, report. As a junior researcher at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, she explores and tests practical methods to involve citizens in the process of designing, planning, and building climate-resilient urban deltas. We also have Haiha Bu Fi, who is currently the Youth Program Officer at UNESCO Hanoi. Driven by her passion for collaboration with young leaders, Haiha fuels youth enthusiasm in changing the status quo in their communities by using innovative and creative ways to involve youth from all walks of life to have a say at the decision-making table. And last but not least, we have Miriam Inam. She is the Reporting and Communications Officer with Youth Empowerment Program at the UN Development Program Pakistan. Throughout her career with organizations including World Wildlife Fund Pakistan and Concern Worldwide, she has worked extensively on issues related to climate change, biodiversity conservation, and humanitarian crises and poverty alleviation. So before we start, I just want to lay a couple of ground rules. First of all, I just want to emphasize that this webinar represents a safe space for the exchange of ideas. So while we may not be in agreement on certain points, Let's all remain respectful of one another's opinions and perspectives, even as we may disagree. 
Next, uh, some guidelines for our speakers. The speakers will be speaking for about seven minutes each. Speakers, when you are not speaking, kindly remember to mute your microphones so there is no background noise or interference. Also, before you begin your presentation, kindly state your name to remind our audience who is speaking. Finally, we will save 20 plus minutes at the end of the webinar to answer questions. If you have questions, kindly enter them in the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. Hassan and I will monitor those. In addition, we should have time for audience members to verbally ask a question or two or make a comment during the Q&A. So if you'd like to do that, kindly use the raise hand button, which is in the upper left quadrant of your uh, screen. Okay, so with that said, let me pass it over to Mosin, who will be our first speaker. All right, so hello guys, I hope you can listen to me well. Thank you so much for joining the session today. Let me start by asking you a very awkward question. How dare you? So, well, that's not very, uh, uh, it didn't come from me, but it came from Greta Thunberg. Last year, a Swedish high school student, Greta Thunberg, painted a sign and went and stood outside parliament. It had just three words, school strike for climate. Uh, so moving on to this year, in September, Greta Thunberg got an opportunity to talk to the UN Global Climate Summit, and she said, you've stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are at the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you talk about is money and fairy tales of endless economic growth. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? And the host is mute themselves. Thank you. Uh, right. So this is the context in which I guess the global youth climate emergency movement came along. And then a question that comes across a lot by a lot of young people is, is it my problem or is it your problem or is it our own global problem? Well, to put things in context, let's see. Greta Thunberg started alone, but quickly she gained allies all across the globe stepping into young people's anger and frustration. Fridays for future climate strikes uh, went global. Now from Uganda to Australia, millions have left their classrooms with demands for their own governance. Uh, Jamie Margolin, who at the same time when Greta Thunberg was uh, going on strike, founded Zero Hour in the US. She says, it's not just an issue on the list for us kids. Oh yes, you can think I intellectually care about climate change because I have time in my spare, uh, time to feel good about myself and take care about my turtle, but no, this is actual existential fear. It's way more than just me as a young person uh, having a phase in life where I care for the climate. Because the impact of climate change are global, it is sometimes difficult to uh, feel linkage to the uh, topic. Uh, you might feel that this is an, uh, this is an issue for someone someone else in the world because it doesn't hit very strong in your own backyard or home. Uh, it's not just it's it's more important to understand how climate change is global, but experiences or impacts are felt in different places in different ways. It impacts people disproportionately. Young people and their families in a vulnerable developing country may become aware of uh, climate change more quickly and directly than if they, they lived in a developed country owing to their different uh, cultural and social uh, and economic circumstances. So then it means that some people will be disproportionately more impacted. So those who have the most to lose are now fed up with this political inaction that has been there for several years. What they're actually fighting for now is their stolen future. We do not want the burden to be thrown on our shoulders. Uh, Jamie went on to say that I get so many messages again and again that youth will save the world. And that is just such an unfair burden to place on a 17-year-old girl or a boy just trying to figure out their life. It's an unfair burden to place on kids who did not cause the problem and do not have the voting power or the monetary power or the resource power that the adults in power have. 
young people, on the other hand, fortunately, in a way, can see that what not many adults can see, a world that is rapidly becoming unrecognizable. The last four years have been the hottest ever recorded. Now, something to consider here is that young people have been talking about climate change for decades now, at least after 1992. But the latest generation of protesters is louder and much more coordinated than the people who came before. That's why we are seeing a shift in uh, a movement that is emerging. The message is clear. The older generation has failed. And it is the young who will, in pay, who will pay in full with their own very future. So it is an issue of intergenerational justice. The UN Secretary General said, my generation has failed to respond properly to the dramatic challenge of climate change. This is deeply felt by young people. No wonder why they are angry. To fully understand the frustration and the anger young people exhibit is not just that they're concerned only about climate change. It's also how it reflects into their daily livelihoods and their way of living. It is, it is supposed to have impacts all across the spectrum, ranging from education to health to uh, their jobs and the money they earn and so on and so forth, their, their ability to manage and grow in corrupt and disinstitutionalized systems. So these are some of the sectors that were identified by young people, how they feel that they need to, uh, how they are being take, uh, how they're not being given a better future. And this was identified in the UN Global Environment Outlook 6 report, which Mandy will talk about more. But you can see on this first screen a spectrum of issues that young people most resonate with and they think that it's not all in their best interest. So what can you, I, or us do? One of the things that was so powerful about this youth movement is that a lot of us are now thinking out of the structure and the system because we have somehow uh, agreed upon that the systems that the adults have created so far isn't working. So we are coming up with new methods of solving issues. Now we have the tools. The science is very clear. All that is required is action for lasting change. And that is where this political commitment uh, and commitment across private and public sectors is needed. We need to act now. We need to act together. And we need to act differently for this to work. So to achieve this uh, transformative action, society really needs young people's open-mindedness, their willingness to take risks, and their ability to innovate. Given young people's minimal vested interest in existing power structures, youth can really question the status quo, which they're doing now, and can speak truth to authority figures if given a place at the decision-making table. Now, you need to understand, as I said initially, that young people are disproportionately affected. Same as for young girls. Girls are often much more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Young people should not be seen as passive victims. More and more so, they should be uh, acknowledged and they should be appreciated and brought on as active agents of change who can then take these changes to their families and communities. But this all sounds very rosy. And besides young people pushing for political action, a lot of it is not being translated into real action. Why? Unfortunately, many of the barriers that are inherent in the system are adult-centric. They go on with the adult-centric nature of institutions and decision-making processes. And without necessary orientation and support, young people can be left disempowered. So what is needed is we need to reset structures that ensure active meaningful youth participation in international, national, and local decision-making and implementation processes and pushes for individual responsibility and collective action. I know we did not sign up for that, but this is the best, worst scenario that we could be in. And if we do not take action now, the cost which we're going to pay in the future is, is way more than what we can anticipate right now. Remember, 
we are the first generation that can end poverty and the last one that can do something about it. The next speakers will talk about individual and collective action potential for meaningful youth participation. Just to give you the last thing to take away from my talk is we need to do three things. We need to let youth speak for themselves. We need to invest in this rising leadership and not in a very tokenistic way, but ensuring that it is meaningful and translated into impact. Otherwise, we'll have a lot more frustration in the system and it might uh, cause troubles for our democratic processes. And finally, we need to uplift intergenerational collaboration where adults and young people come together and try to solve the issues that are. Thank you. Over to you, Matthew. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Mandy, uh, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Mandy van der Ende, and as Matthew already introduced me, I'm the coordinating lead author of the Geo6 for Youth ebook. And this ebook is basically uh, uh, based on uh, the main GEO report, which is published by the UN Environment this year. And because that ebook is about 700 pages long, we didn't really expect you to read that. So we created an ebook with the most important uh, messages of the main report. And the ebook will be launched in 2020. So if we we'll move on to the next. Uh, slide we see uh, that in the ebook we basically describe the base the current state of the earth system uh, in terms of three subsystems air and climate plant and biodiversity and freshwater and ocean and for each of these subsystems we looked into the future as it was 2050 uh, and we created two scenarios also based on the geo report so it's uh, scientifically founded um, the business as usual scenario, basically, um, that's actually the path we are on right now. We are heading to that future. And it implies that no major policy change or um, social, societal change or economic change uh, will happen from now on. Um, now, then there's the more sustainable scenario that implies also that implies that change will happen, but then only within sectors. So, for example, if one country switches to biomass in order to uh, generate a renewable energy, then in another country that can have negative imp impact in terms of deforestation, for example. So, yes, it is better than the business as usual scenario, but it doesn't bring us the real sustainable future that we want. Because that is, as you see in the Sustainable Development Goals, that res a res sustainable future would respect all Sustainable Development Goals um, at the same time. And that is not happening in this system. So for that new system to, um, to, to, to happen, we need transformative change, a new way of thinking more holistically about solutions than um, that respect all sustainable development goals. And now I hear you thinking, how can I possibly contribute as an individual to a transformation of a whole system? Well, we will take, I will take you to, through some examples because it's um, actually already happening. The next slide, um, you see the building blocks. And this is basically a an, an combination of all efforts that we need to take in order to transformation transformations to happen. And I will make it even more concrete in the next slide. Um, well, every for every transformation to initiate needs a vision of what a desired future is. You need to be really clear of what you want and what you don't want. And you also um, shouldn't be afraid to disrupt the system. And basically, you see here, um, this is one individual with one very clear desired future, and she's also not afraid to show it. And of course, as we see in the next slide, she's not alone in this, because all around the world, youth have collaborated and gathered the street and showed their collective desire of this very same desired future, a sustainable future. And this is so incredibly important because this is the only way we can let our governments know 
that this is not the way that we want to and um, they will because they're only focusing on short-term solutions and they care about votes only um, this is our way to show what we will vote on and what we will not vote on so basically Fridays for Future is a very very strong statement to let the government know that we do not agree on this and um, we need we want another system so the next slide um, you see that transformative change can also be um, through our daily choices. Because from the moment that you wake up until you go to sleep, you make hundreds of choices that either contribute to the status quo, so the business as usual scenario, or to the more sustainable scenario, or a real sustainable scenario, I have to say. So, um, for example, um, in terms of food, eat less meat, for example, um, when I stopped eating meat five years ago, there was almost no alternative in the supermarket. Whereas now, only five years later, there's plenty of them. So that is a super clear example of a system that is changing already. Markets are responding to youth that want to change their lifestyle. So um, yeah, it is already happening, and it's super excited to see. And you can, you can see that for every choice, also for waste and energy, it's the same. Um, the next slide is about career choice. This is a um, choice that we probably make only once in our life, or maybe sometimes, but it is a more long-lasting choice. Um, in our ebook, we show that every job in any sector can be green. Um, it, it, it should only uh, contribute to a green economy or a circular economy. And for example, you can be a eco constructor, you can be more into technology, urban planning, education, fashion design, and you can, or you can be an artist. Any job can be turned green if only you take some effort to, to look into it and to see what actually is a green job. And you can read that in our ebook because that's too long to describe now. So this is uh, where I want to end with. Um, transform I, I probably already um, disappointed many of you in the case that I didn't really say something really new. Um, transformative change is no rocket science. Actually, it's already happening. And I am sure that many of you already contribute to this change. You maybe only don't recognize it. So what we need to do is don't lose hope, um, scale all these good initiatives, um, inspire others, let them grow, let, let, let good initiatives grow and make the right choices every day again. And then in the end, as Barack Obama says here in this quote, one voice can change a room, and if one voice can change a room, it can change a city, a state, a nation, and the whole world. So maybe we're still in the room. Um, about to change the city. And if we continue like this, then we can even change the whole world. We only need to re remember that transformation, transformative change takes time even more than a generation. So we're just about to start. And um, yeah, all we need to do is continue. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Mandy. That was very informative and very inspirational. Um, let's move on to our third speaker, Hi Ha. Hi Ha, take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, hi, it's great being here. So yeah, my name is Ayha Wuti, and I am the Youth Project Officer at UNESCO. Um, I would like to start by um, going back to um, going back a few years, actually a lot of years, um, I still remember my time in high school. There was this one day when the school would invite a policymaker, and I was extremely excited finally being able to share my concerns, to share my, my opinions, and seeing how they would react. Well, the higher my expectation, I believe the bigger my disappointment, when he turned my words into his own campaign speech, in a way leaving me wondering, oh, so my words don't actually matter. And you know, moving on, I thought, no, I'm not, uh, this is not going to frustrate me, and I don't want this to happen to any other young person 
who is so eager to engage in politics, um, feeling neglected or feeling unheard. So I started to work in different countries, um, Nepal, France, um, Germany, um, Sierra Leone, and like now in, in Vietnam with like different organizations, be it NGO or like a startup or now, yes, yeah, international organization, UNESCO, to really find avenues for young people to contribute meaningfully and to have a seat at the decision-making table. And not only a seat, but being taken seriously and, you know, having, having a say. And I know that sounds extremely ambitious. Um, so, like, I want to, to share with you some examples, like an example from Vietnam, how we approached it. And, like, maybe you can apply it in your, um, in your city, in your, you know, in your network, or, like, in your country. So in Vietnam, um, the Ministry of Home Affairs is, um, we, we work very closely with the Ministry of Home Affairs, who is um, designated to um, the, the review of the youth law, the revision of the youth law. And we managed together with other UN agencies to convince them that we have to establish a youth advisory group. And those members, 30 altogether, are coming from very different backgrounds. They are um, entrepreneurs, they are educators, they are activists. They're individuals that are just eager to engage in different topics relating to education, gender equality, employment, health, um, participation, you know, climate change, etc. And we knew we couldn't just throw them into the water, um, into like the world of consultation meetings and having them, you know, feel extremely frustrated. We needed to sort of teach them how to swim. So what we did was really organizing a series of different um, capacity building training for them to really develop their own their own vision, their own mission, understanding what do we actually want to achieve. Because if you just go and say, well, uh, I am for climate, you know, I'm I'm against climate change, and I want to make a change, or like in favor of climate, them um, in favor of um, gender equality, it's it's not concrete enough. You know, when you work with policymakers, you have to have really smart, so-called smart recommendations. So we really guided them through it. Um, and like you know, till now they're very, and they're very confident. And but what we really stressed uh, throughout the entire process, um, and still today, that they are just a very small entity. You know, from like 23 million young Vietnamese. So they they cannot speak for everyone. So you need to consider the intersectionality of, of you know, problems and and realities. Because you as an individual, you have your own reality of your own challenges that you face. But maybe your neighbor or, you know, like a migrant, person from LGBTQI community, they are having a different life experience. And you need to understand that it differs significantly from yours. So what we did was initiating um, a youth-led research initiative. And it was really owned by youth. You know, young people um, decided on their target um, groups. They decided on the budget, the location, the research design. Like, everything was really owned by them. And it was only us being sort of in, like, at the side mentoring if necessary. But it really helped them to better comprehend the challenges of others. And I think this is extremely important for, for all of you as well, like being able to have empathy and like understanding that your reality differs. And throughout the process, we also stress, like in the end, how do you disseminate your results? How do you disseminate your information with the wider public? Because it's so relevant to understand who is your target group, because it's so um, differs if you use video or like a play or you use a fact sheet or you use a podcast. If you're not using the right channel, you might not even reach the ones you want to um, influence. So um, this was, uh, yeah, this was like, I mean, like we're still in the process, but I think um, it's been it's been going quite well and they've gained a lot of confidence and I received the draft um, youth law and like we've seen that they have changed the wording, being a bit more inclusive. They have, you know, like really included voices that were missed the last time thanks to the youth, and even though it's just something very small, um, it, it, it really helped it really helped them, I guess, and it also helped us to see that, you know, youth have this agency and they can make a change. It just takes a bit of time. And, uh, you know, moving forward, they are, it's not just a one-off activity, So we started, you know, with, with um, establishing that group, they have been, they have been trained, and like now in the follow-up, they will be training other youth. So they will be designing their own content, they will be facilitating training for young people in another UNESCO um, project. But it's really also on them of leading it. So yeah, like I just wanted to share with you this example of showing um, how young people can make a change, you know, like slowly um, but surely. 
and I think especially like in your case, it's so relevant to think about the realities of others and like why maybe some of the people are reluctant to understand that there is climate change. So understanding, is it because of lack of knowledge? Is it because of lack of exposure? Is it because they maybe grew up in an environment where everyone denied the very fact that climate change even exists? So then you need to really change your, um, your approach and your wording and um, really use also like their language in order for them to, 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 feel, to feel approached and um, feel talked to. So like in the end, I just want to really invite all of you to extend your network, to engage with the right range of young people, to be really holistic and inclusive. Because you know, other, their languages, their stories, their views, their living circumstances, it might really differ significantly from yours. And knowing that will make you such a better um, advocate for your, um, yeah, for your own advocacy. So yeah, this is um, this is for me. But I hello. Um, it sounded like I was gone. Yeah, like I don't think I can go into the details, but I hope that like in the Q and A session we will have you know more time to to talk about you know different ways of approaching and um, you know rethinking our own approach and how do how do we use language and etc. But yeah, I think I end here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, hi -ha. So let's move on to our final speaker. I'd like to introduce Miriam. Uh, Miriam, go ahead and take it away when you're ready. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Manam, and I work as Reporting and Communications Officer with Youth Empowerment Program at UNDP Pakistan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of being a part of this really interesting panel discussion. So I will be briefly talking about UNDP's Youth Empowerment Program and our work around youth and climate change. But before I get started on that, let me first explain Pakistan's demographics. Um, Pakistan is the home to over 207 million people and is the fifth most populous country in the world. 68% of our population is under the age of 29 and 27% of the total population falls in the youth bracket. So as you can tell, we represent a classic case of youth bulge, which brings with itself several development challenges. But we believe if harnessed effectively, youth bulge can lead to economic growth, prosperity and progressive social transformation particularly in terms of climate action. Essentially, youth, uh, youth Empowerment Program is a strategic response to the challenges posed by the youth bulge. The program provides opportunities to uh, youth under three E's, education, engagement, and economic empowerment, and is aiming to make young people an integral part of the development process. If you look at education, the quality and quantity in Pakistan remains suboptimal. We have issue of out-of-school children, inadequate school infrastructure, teacher absenteeism, but above all, the educational curriculum is not aligned with the growing demands of the society and the job market. So we're trying to holistically address this issue. From a policy perspective, we are working with the federal education bodies and we're trying to ensure that the imported education actually aligns with the market demands, including the growing demands for sustainable development and climate change adaptation. We're also working directly with students and colleges, students of colleges and universities. We're involving them for carrying out research on issues related to climate change and we're taking their recommendations for addressing these problems and actually we're trying to prototype their ideas for future projects. This is not only helping us gather consolidated data and information, but is also giving us out of the box ideas on how to deal with climate change issues, while simultaneously also enhancing research capabilities of young students, which is a marketable skill. Recently, we started prototyping a model for controlling deforestation with one of the universities we have also set up a research laboratory in one of the universities for coming up with innovative solutions for dealing with climate change. Other than that, we are extensively working with young people across the country for carrying out awareness campaigns. We are working with students of public schools and colleges for campaigning against single-use plastic. We are also extensively engaging them in, in our afforestation campaigns. Um, we recently started an, uh, an initiative called Adopt a Tree, where they are made responsible for taking care of the trees for its entire life cycle to ensure that the planted saplings actually survive. So by making youth part of these campaigns and activities, we're not only trying to create awareness in the communities, but we're also trying to inculcate climate activism at individual level, and we are hoping for behavioral change in the society through increased environmental awareness. Another key area we are focusing on is economic empowerment. 
So Pakistan's total unemployment rate is estimated to be around 4.2, while youth unemployment is significantly higher to about 8. We need to create at least 1.5 million jobs annually to accommodate growing number of young people to join, uh, who join the workforce. And the only way to address this is if we promote youth-led economic growth where market responsive skills are provided to young people. Since Pakistan is one of the top most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change, there's actually a huge demand for climate change adaptation measures and potential for young people to be utilized in these interventions, provided they have the right skills. Um, UNDP is carrying out multiple climate change adaptation projects where youth is playing an integral part. One of such projects is actually being implemented in northern areas of Pakistan in Gilgit, Baltistan region, where climate change impact has uh, climate change has impacted hydrological flow. Um, UNDP is working to build capacity of youth to install the required infrastructure, and as a result, local youth is being empowered and contracted for ongoing construction work, a skill that they can also uh, utilize later on. Apart from this, the intervention is also benefiting the young women in this community who were otherwise responsible for fetching water for household needs. It would almost take them the entire day to bring water, but with easy access, these young women are now enable are now can now in, enroll in schools and colleges and can give time to their education. And lastly, we are emphasizing on increasing youth engagement through our program. Uh, Pakistan is actually one of the three countries that slipped from medium to low levels of human development between 2010 and 2015. And this decline was largely attributed to extremely low levels of political and civic participation among youth in the country. So UNDP has, uh, it has been working to increase constructive engagement, particularly between youth and the policymakers. We are trying to provide them engagement platforms so that they can voice their opinions. Recently, we conducted youth policy caravans across the country where youth, particularly the excluded youth from remote areas, um, raised the challenges they face and gave recommendations, including those related to climate change, uh, related to climate action, actually. For instance, need, the need for creating uh, awareness regarding climate change in the community, the need for disability inclusive disaster, disaster risk reduction measures for differently abled youth in the disaster prone areas. Um, in addition to that, UNDP is also working to mainstream youth in the climate action through policy. Currently, we are in the process of reviewing and updating national climate change policy of the government of Pakistan, and we are trying to make youth an integral part of it all. So essentially, this is what UNDP has been doing. Uh, UN, this is the sort of work we're doing through 3E's approach. And we're including youth in the fight against climate change. So just to quickly summarize, we're including them in the policies. We're carrying out advocacy environmental awareness interventions with them to encourage behavioral change. And we're also carrying out activities for them to increase their capacity and, and economically empower them so that they become more resilient. Um, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you. Um, so let's enter the question and answer uh, portion. Um, I've got one from the chat box here that I'll read. Um, it had to do, and I'll just throw this out there. Um, whoever wants to respond can respond. Um, given the current, you know, kind of global political climate, you know, the fact that sometimes governments don't really seem to take the issue um, as, seriously, as, as seriously as they should and, and don't seem to seem to listen to what young people have to say, how do we navigate the social and political climate of today in order to, to actually make a difference? You know, like what would you say to a young person who says, how do I do this? How do I navigate through um, this social and political climate? And I'll just throw that out there to whoever wants to jump on it. Maybe I can start. Hi, guys. I'm Mohsen. Um, so as a thought, I, I sort of agreed with what uh, the, the question says here. And I was trying to put this point across that the adult-centric institutions and decision-making processes often leave uh, young people quite frustrated. And they don't have the right channels through which they could uh, navigate their voice. But that is actually the challenge. But that is equally an opportunity. It would be great if governments are willing to listen to young people and not just tokenistically say that youth are the future, but they actually believe that and put an action for that. But if they can't, then you need to create your own channels. You have to be a lot more resilient than you think you might have to, and you have to have a lot of positivity and hope. 
which you can then transfer into other people along with your own self. So it's really important that you open your own doors and opportunities in that regard. I can give you an example, like when I created Green Box in Pakistan, nobody was talking about environmental education in that regard or education for sustainable development. Uh, uh, the idea was looked down, people laughed upon it and things, but I kept going. I didn't. I looked for unconventional partners. We often think that the government is the only partner, but the, the local people, local communities, uh, schools, uh, clerics, religious scholars, uh, so on and so forth. There's a, there are a lot of non, uh, uh, you know, major stakeholders which you could engage with and still have a lot of impact in your community. So you have to be innovative. You have to be disruptive. And you need to make uh, way across whatever is thrown at you. Thank you. Um, if anyone else wants to, to jump in, that's fine too. But actually, I'd just kind of like to follow up. Another um, question was asking for, you know, actionable steps. And um, Mosin, when you just talked about, you know, partnering with kind of unconventional or innovative partners, you know, kind of thinking outside the box in that regard, I wonder if um, just drawing on your own experience with Greenbox uh, and thinking about you know this idea of actionable steps, how did you go about reaching out to partners? How, how did you go about that? So to begin with, me and my friend, we invested in our own skills. It's uh, I, this is something I tell a lot of young people that you need to build your own capacity to bring out the change you think that should be there in the community. It's easier to blame than to uh, invest in yourself and take a lead. So we invested in learning how a good uh, social entrepreneurship business is started. How do I create a business model? There are so many tools like business model canvas and undertaking, uh, uh, you know, just sit down, take a paper, write down your own interest and gaps and see where we could really intervene and you know create an innovative space or an action. Now, having said that, we were very naive when we started going into this, so we had to pivot the idea a lot. We faced a lot of uh, criticism, a lot of uh, rejection, but we just kept going. We started, uh, so I really believe in what Steve Jobs says. He said, uh, before you ask, the answer is always no. So we kept reaching out to people through cold emails, through meeting at different networking events, and possibly trying to share our vision and pitching the idea to as many people as possible. And sometimes we came along, sometimes they did not. But as long as you're true to your vision and you really want the thing to happen, you may have to pivot your idea then and there and take all the opportunities that come along the way and make something out. So in terms of reaching out to stakeholders, my uh, absolute uh, most important advice would be be very clear of what you want out of it. Have simple, actionable objectives and then pursue that. Do not throw a lot towards them because that might be overwhelming, but have one or two actionable objectives and that should possibly lead to some good stuff. Thank you. May I add one thing to this, Matthew? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, so this is Hassan, I'm the other twin he was referring to. Uh, one of the key factors I think what has led to the success or going towards the, that successful journey of Greenbox is that we always believed in creating a community around this. You alone or your team is not enough for such a big social or environmental challenge at hand to really work towards. So you really need to have that community which is your champion out there in the field. And community, uh, community doesn't only mean community of peers, you know, it could be someone in the government, it could be someone uh, in the school or as Mohsen mentioned about religious scholars or people like that. So find those champions within the community and kind of create that smaller community around them, uh, around those people for the whatever theme you're working on, let's say uh, we were working on solid waste management in a particular village. Okay, now let's, that's a problem at hand. Further look at the problem like 
just don't stick to the problem. Look at the problem behind the problem, you know, do a stakeholder mapping exercise, kind of really break down the problem into further understanding what really led to this problem, a kind of an actionable step process, you know, what's really, what are the behaviors of these people or what really leads them to not put the waste in the bin next to them? Why do they throw it down? You know, what are those behavioral barriers? So these kind of learning you cannot have your own, or you cannot have on your own if you do not really interact with the community who really lives there. So maybe do an observatory visit or a shadowing visit, just be a, a silent observer one day to really capture onto the behaviors of those people and then understanding. So these are the kind of small actionable kind of attitudes as a team you need to have is that we need to move beyond the idea of that this is only my idea or my business or my baby because the problem is so large you need to have a sense of community around this. I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Matthew. Great. Thank you very much, Asan. And Asan, do you have, I know that we both have a list of uh, questions here that we want to ask. Do you have a question you would like to pose to any of the speakers? I'll ask Haiha because she deals with policymakers and government officials and everyone. How do you tackle climate change deniers, you know, since uh, we're speaking from all parts of the world, so there is this big part of the political community who doesn't believe in climate change. So how do we go about dealing with these kind of people, you know? Do we even should really care about them or should we just do our own thing? Hi, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I mean, like, at least within the Vietnamese context, we haven't actually had that problem that the government would entirely deny that climate change exists. They're actually quite open to it and very they're open to suggestions from like the youth on how um, can we include like more sustainable approaches. But maybe just like generally, I don't think we should um, just yeah move away and say I'm not going to talk to you. But I think something that I said earlier was trying to understand why are they so resistant to to maybe even try to understand why climate change exists and they might have um, something to do with it, you know, that their actions have an effect with others. It could really be that they don't have that knowledge because climate change is so complex and so complicated. I think, you know, looking also online how people talk about climate change, they're using terminologies that not everyone understands. So you need to, you need to break it down. You need to make it really accessible for the person that you're talking with. And that could also include someone from, you know, from, from the government. Um, you need to make them understand. I mean, like, given maybe their priority, you can look into what is the priority of the government. And definitely you will find a link between climate change and, you know, their priorities. And you can show how not investing in climate change will um, contribute to them not uh, not moving forward and, you know, like um, not having economic, economic growth. So you have to sort of, in a way, like show, show those links so that they are more convinced. If you're just using your own language and like your own maybe testimonies, it might not really fly. So it's a lot of, I think, about research, um, understanding your 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 like your person in front of you, and then finding ways with you know with 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 collective intelligence, with um, your with your friends, with your um, other activists to to work with them. It is not like this this entire um, narrative of us and them. I think creates even even a bigger divide. So we we should rather like see where do we agree. Sorry, I'm talking way too much. I agree much. with you, Haiha. No, no, I absolutely agree with Haiha, and this is something that Nandi is also saying, that often politicians cannot understand, or they have no clue in what form they have to engage youth, or what's the best way to tackle climate change and stuff. In my own research, so my doctoral research is around environmental governance processes and how we can mainstream youth in that. One of the biggest problems that has emerged is Nobody knows how to define environment or climate change in their own uh, context. And often it's the strategy of the commons. The issue is so huge that I just close my eyes and I let anyone else deal with it. So that is one of the basic reasons that how we frame the problem. Framing the problem is an issue for a lot of people. So then they cannot go in to solve it. So we need more research evidence. We need more uh, 
stories. We need more uh, uh, facts and figures from our own communities, which would mobilize uh, policymakers, politicians, private firms to take action in that regard. And in my humble opinion, it's really important that young people lead that uh, evidence generation so that their voices are not marginalized and are given the platform which they need. Thank you. Great. Um, and I realize we're getting close to our 11 o'clock mark, if not past it. But why don't we, um, why don't we do a couple of more questions? Um, let's see. This one is maybe, I, I was thinking of directing this towards Mandy, but anyone can, can jump in. You know, we've mentioned um, Greta Thunberg and this amazing kind of movement that's, that, that she is associated with. Um, and part of that is, uh, you know, young people all across the world going on um, missing school and going on a climate strike. Um, in fact, just a few weeks ago in Baltimore, I watched probably a couple of thousand young people marching um, outside my office window with uh, uh, wonderful signs and, and chanting, and it was, it was amazing. But my question is, is missing school and going on strike the best solution to this problem? How, how sustainable is it? Like, what, what are your assessments of um, the kind of things that are going on um, around this movement? Right, I, uh, because I mentioned Greta, I'll just throw in some points and I'll uh, uh, want other speakers to please add up. So to me, you need to look at it in terms of any other civil disobedience movement. All across the globe, we need to create momentum around something. So I don't see how missing school for some days is going to be a problem for now, but I do see how this civil disobedience could lead to frustration and possibly, uh, you know, uh, causing trouble for our democratic processes and systems. If whatever these young people are saying and asking you to do, that is not translated into action. That is where I see the problem. For now, the world is getting away with talk tokenistically saying youth are the future. But as we clo go close to 2050 and beyond, they are becoming the reality and they're no more the future. And all that was anticipated as a challenge will then become our re re real everyday troubles to manage. So just like in any civil disobedience movement, unless it translates into something uh, productive, it gets messy. So we need to now move beyond this tokenism rhetoric and actually start listening and giving people these platforms. We have ring the bell. Uh, people are ready, uh, pe uh, young people are on the, uh, roads and they're telling people that listen to us, okay, now give them a seat, give them a seat on the table. I think it was in, during the black civil disobedience movement, uh, there was Lady Maya, she said that if they do not give you table, uh, if they do not give you a chair on the table, you take your own folding chair and put it there. So I guess that is the natural next step that is going to happen, uh, even if the governments are not willing to listen. Young people will take that space in a either a friendly or a messy way, depending on how the people on the other side of it. Great. Would anyone else like to chime in on that question? Okay. So we are at about 11.05. Asan, would you like to ask one more question, or do you think we should uh, wrap up? There's this one question around uh, how to bring your social ideas around climate change as an institution, as a business, or as, as an enterprise for someone who's a young student in a college, or like, let's say they have an idea, how do they go about that, you know? Is it they start as a movement, or they start as a business, or as a social enterprise? So anyone who wants to chime in on that would be good. I think in terms of an entrepreneurial spirit, <laughs> I can't resist answering this question. <laughs> so maybe I'll start and then you guys can add on. It's like, of course, started as a pilot, as, as an experiment, something which you believe in, your idea. Take it and do it out, like do it in the community. Go test it. Don't wait for that perfect grant or the perfect business idea and then you're going to make your 
uh, business plan and then find the investors and that all would follow. It's just that as a social enterprise or as someone who has a social idea, uh, so, uh, social or a development um, problem at hand, go. Go out in the community, do the whatever initiative or whatever solution you're proposing, go and experiment as um, as an advocate for experimentation, I would always say that it should be dirtier, cheaper, and quicker kind of approach. Go out there, test your idea, test your hypothesis rather. I would say it's a hypothesis right now. Go test it. If it's proven, bring it back, find the champions, kind of make a community around this, which you would refer to as a team for your social venture or social project, and then move into the cycle of either you have to register it as an organization or as a business, but do not jump on to just waiting for that perfect moment, you know. Take that dirty route. Great. Thank you. Anyone else have any um, final comments they would like to make? Okay. Um, well, I guess this is a good place to wrap it up. Um, Asan, I'm going to give you the, the final word, um, but I just want to thank all of our uh, panelists and all of our um, audience members for participating. This has been really um, a very interesting conversation. Um, Asan, let me give you the uh, final word here. Uh, likewise, I would uh, want to thank all the panelists, the youth participants, and the practitioners, and especially to the Youth Power Learning Team. Thank you so much for arranging this, as well as sponsoring uh, uh, our sponsors, International Youth Foundation. Thank you so much. Uh, I would just pick the quote which Mohsen said, uh, and leave you guys on that, is that we are the first generation who can end poverty, and we are the last which can fight climate change. So I think that's a good bedtime thinking for a few people. <laughs> it's 9 o'clock in Pakistan, so I'll think about how I can really fight climate change. And for if it's morning time for you guys, look around yourself, observe where you can play your part, you know. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much. Um... Hassan, thank you, Matthew. I'll be um, handing over to Rachel, uh, one of our colleagues in here, uh, who will be um, wrapping, closing up um, up for this webinar. Thank you. I want to say a big thanks to our speakers and facilitators for this interesting inf information-packed webinar. If you're wondering how you can access some of these resources, you can visit youthlead.org to access the resources. There's lots of resources on climate change and other social issues on the platform. We'll also share the webinar on the platform, so be sure to sign up if you're not already a member of Youth Leave. And then how can you join and contribute? Um, like I said, you can join youthlead.org, complete your profile, post projects, there's discussion boards. We also have a, a monthly newsletter for updates. And you can also join and share it on social media at Youth Leave Global on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and with that, thank you for our sponsor, International Youth Foundation, and especially our speakers from Green Box, Pakistan. Uh, we'd also like to thank you for including our audience um, for joining today's webinar. We hope you will join our next webinars as well. We hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Iha.